What is going on there, citizens of the Reject Nation? We are here right now at IMAX headquarters as we just had our Real Rejects private exclusive Dune Part 2 event. This was something that uh, we were so excited to be a part of. I'm not like a shill for studios, but if there's one thing I would be a shill for, it is it would, IMAX, it's baby. probably the IMAX experience. Oh, 100%. I've, I saw like the Dark Knight and, and IMAX like 10 times. This is before the channel ever existed on IMAX. The way I would explain why it's important to see this movie on IMAX is because there are films that are converted to be able to be screened on IMAX and then there's the other camp there are movies that are specifically shot with IMAX cameras Dune Part 2 is one of those films meaning this is the version it was meant to be seen in. Definitive. They shot this whole movie with IMAX cameras so you get that expanded aspect ratio you get the best quality the best sound this is not me just doing the hype train this is literally the version that our director Den our director <laughs> <laughs> captain my captain <laughs> Denis Villeneuve I still don't pronounce his last Villeneuve. name he intended for us to see it in this format and for a movie like this which is so much about sensory immersion experience it more than delivers and enthralling you in that experience it envelops you in the frame we want to talk about the visuals we want to talk about the story we want to talk about cast there's a lot that we got to dive into but we only got a limited amount of time we're gonna be here for let's just dive right into it guys so yeah it picks up immediately i would say like two and a half minutes after <laughs> yes, the, there's a counter after the first movie leaves off where you have paul atreides timothy chalamet and rebecca ferguson they're venturing off to learn the ways of the fremen people and then you got uh, the heart conans or harkonans i hear two different pronunciations right g what is it is it Har harkonans i think harkonan is what people agree upon we're on a limited amount of time we got to get well, Harkonnen. Right. Harkonnen. Final so, answer. Yeah. So we, we got the uh, Harkonnens. They want to continue spice production, but they also want to wipe out the frame. There's a whole lot of political warfare and all these things happening right now. I don't know where to begin because the movie is so like overwhelming. So let's just get the most obvious thing out of the way. The visual experience here. The visuals here, they're carrying over from what we got from Dune Part 1. Whatever you saw from there, they are expanding upon it. And you get to see some other parts of the galaxy <laughs> i just want to talk about the sand the, the riding the sandworm scene <laughs> <laughs> sure. right. yeah, yeah, yeah. like this sequence i think is going to be talked about for such a long time the way i would liken it and it's strange to say but you know whenever you see tom cruise doing these like crazy stunts and you're like wow they got the camera there you get to really feel like you're with you really feel the perspective of this death defying act yeah. right now yeah, yeah, yeah it evokes that exact same visceral response as an audience member Yet it's not real, but it <laughs> you feels real, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like, that, it speaks to just that level of immersion and the way that the movie does take its time to really live in these events and things like that so that you can feel the struggle, the growth of the character in a physical form. Because it's not, you know, the talkiest of movies necessarily, especially when it comes to the content. And that's what partly is so great is you do have these breathtaking, scopic moments of action that also, you know, are rousing in a character sense in the sand worm sequence is movie magic it's movie magic and there's more movie magic to be had there's a little bit more action than the last movie and uh, there's a variety of different kinds of action set pieces but they're always grounded in the emotionality of the characters everything is so much about the emotion first and foremost and that's what makes for the most rewarding action scenes so while you're getting these like beautiful visuals laced throughout with this impeccable sound design i don't know who the cinematographer is i i, I always think everyone's oh, roger deakins when it looks yeah. good but i know it's not roger deakins i, I almost i i wanted to commit his name to memory because he shot the Batman. I believe in this. Oh, well you get those vibes Dune, there. The first Dune. So like there's such a, a beautiful palette of colors and visuals across this yeah. frames obviously as augmented by the scope of IMAX but really like the composition and the way it brings you into the world is impeccable. I haven't read the book. You've read the book or you've read most of the book? I've read the book but I mean there are people who know the book much better than I do. I've, okay. I've shotgunned it the once and did my best to hold on you know. Well when the credits <laughs> were rolling you said something John is the best at putting into <laughs> words what I'm trying to say. That's what usually happens in these discussions. I ramble. John says it efficiently following after my ramble. <laughs> you, you give me everything to work with and then I spit out a cube. That's how we work together. <laughs> yeah. The first movie, uh, this is how he was saying, I'm just trying to say what you're saying. Here we go. <laughs> is that the first movie has like a, a lot of political angles and there's a lot of political commentary while you have like the Bene Gesserit and a little bit more of the magical stuff, a secondary or third. And this movie is a bit of an inverse. Now the political stuff is all still there. The magical side and the, the mysticism is way more at the forefront. And at the same time, it surprised me because it's so much of a deconstruction 
of prophecy and religion it deals so much with power uh, how religion can manipulate take control of people that it deals with uh, fanaticism so much on its mind that is not in a black and white context it even though there's some great black and white scenes in here but it's not <laughs> it's, <in> a, true. <laughs> it's not it's any, not all orange there's so much on its mind that it's kind of crazy to see a blockbuster that follows up the first one while doing themes that can be like controversial to touch on uh, because, you know, religion is a very sensitive thing, but this is a made up religion. So maybe there's a way they can do it. But <laughs> you could yeah. see all the metaphors and allegories. And I love how the first movie ends off on this note of, all right, I've seen this movie before, especially someone hasn't read the book. Like, this is Chosen One. This is Timothy yeah, Chalamet. He's going to rise one. to be the special and, you know, lead some new age of salvation for these people or whatever, reset the balance of life in this galaxy. Denis Villeneuve has talked a lot about how he wanted to honor the original intention of Frank. Herbert, which was to make it a cautionary tale, to, sh to make this more of a tragedy. To deconstruct that myth rather than just give you a direct translation of it, you know. And weirdly being prepped for that before watching it, I thought actually made the film more effective. The movie is long. In the first hour of this film is so much with really showing uh, Paul Atreides' earning his way with learning the culture of the Fremen. When occasionally you cut back to the Harkonnens on their planet, you could really see like light side, dark side, you see, you know? Literally. And, but there's yeah. so much beauty with the Fremen that you're like, oh wait, but Denny keeps saying it's a tragedy. So you kind of just like have yeah. this, this worry and, and the way it does come upon you, it, it's an insidious way it creeps up on you. It is tragic and it is unsettling. Like this is one of those movies that I'm like, wow, for a blockbuster, as beautiful as it is, it does leave you with a feeling of not like cheering. <laughs> it leaves you with like a almost disturbed feeling, even though the it's not disturbing visually without spoiling the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're you're like, what is the achievement? You know, like, are we truly ascending or is this turning? into something more twisted or is this turning into something that could be treacherous you know and, and they let you teeter at times on that you know question especially through Paul because he is the center figure of so many of the circumstances that are happening I think with that in mind Timothy Chalamet is an actor who can often go a little bit back and forth for me this is one of my favorite performances uh, he's ever done I really liked him as Paul Atreides in, in Dune Part 1 but specifically here he goes through a very distinct transformation, needless to say. I thought he was powerful in a lot of scenes. I think for the most part, he's a very powerful actor. There's a lot he has to kind of sell you on with a certain level, but especially in the last half of this movie. And for me, it really worked. It works again so much in terms of the story, the characters, the themes. He's aware of the programming that he has had his whole life. And, and so much of this is about, can you fight against your programming? Can you fight against quote unquote manipulated destiny? What happens if you try to go against that? And you could feel this like internal struggle and what happens if you try to surrender? Is it, is, should you surrender? And I think he carries the weight of this film so so much on his shoulders that it was the most impressive one of the most impressive mo performances I've seen him do I liked him more here than I did in Wonka that's usually what people <laughs> hey. will say when they walk out of this movie is is I like <laughs> <Paul Atreides, laughs> or Wonka <laughs> which one there's <laughs> very two different sides of Chalamet right yeah. there I, but I agree no I, I think the transformation he goes through is 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 really strong and as somebody who you know saw the first movie and was like yeah he's fine I like him he's he's fine yeah that's one of our disagreements I, I, was, I remember that yeah like I, I thought he gripped me more here and like like the position his character is in, it makes sense why the character is the way that he is. And I thought that the transformations here and the questions that he's grappling with were pretty compelling and made that character grow in a way that felt very tangible yeah. to me. And yeah, just watching somebody try and figure out like, where am I in this whole system of things? Can I take control of it? Can I impact it in a way that takes some weight off of my conscience and mm -hmm. maybe creates a better path forward? And I think that's a very compelling question to ask while also watching someone physically transform in a way that might be counter to that. There's a lot of shades he has to play, and I think he's well cast here. <laughs> Zendaya gets like five minutes more screen time than the last. No, she's, she's, <laughs> she's way more in this film. That was something I was a little bit, I don't know if the right word was apprehensive, but I was... That was a little apprehensive, yeah. Uh, well, of the how first movie, yeah, you have such mysticism surrounding her. So, like, what's it going to be like when you're just actually with her as a character? And is it going to feel perfunctory? Is it going to feel forced? Because there's so much about, like, destiny, love between the two of them. I think they have really good chemistry, and some of my favorite scenes are actually with them because so much of what this movie builds upon, without going into spoilers, is their relationship specifically. Zendaya brings a very naturalistic quality to the performance. She works off Timothy Chalamet really well. Their romance is so important and integral to the overarching 
different themes. And she also represents a different side of the Fremen because they make it really distinctly clear that there's two sides to the Fremen here. The ones who really believe in, in, in the one, to, what's the word, the one to save us? The, oh, I forget all the fancy oh, dude uh, made up the words. The Lizan Al-Gaib, yes. Oh, you're so the, smart. The That's why he's here. <laughs> yeah. She's not one of the people who believes in that. So while there's the, the romance with Paul Atreides, she's not drawn to the, the mythological thing. He's, he's just a man to her. <laughs> then you got Javier Bardem's character coming back here who does believe in those things. Who is of the more fundamentalist sect, yeah. And Javier Bardem is... He was like funny in the first one, but man, he is surprisingly <laughs> hilarious at times. Cracking in a lot of jokes in a way time. that doesn't pull you out of the movie, though. It it actually works. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He he is a, an interesting presence because obviously he has his stern Javier Bardem quality, but he does equate to one of the most welcoming and warming presences yeah. throughout the entire two movies. I think what people really want to hear about too, Austin Butler. My man. I, I mean, I thought he was pretty terrific. I mean, he doesn't spend a heck of a lot of time on screen, but he is a, a feral creature of a character, most certainly. He's Matt Smith meets Stellan Skarsgård. Yes. What he's doing in this movie. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> he is. There was yeah. a detail I thought was nice that they had to, he's like, well, this is a guy directly related to Stellan Skarsgård, so we better have that accent. <laughs> and the, the trailers do tease a fight between him and Paul. He has it quite a few times. I would say the emotion to that fight was like gripping as hell yeah yeah, yeah no, like, absolutely what's gonna happen <laughs> yeah this is a movie where, really... where the action sequences very much have like that emotional weight and that's a lot of what drives them they might not be as extensive mm -hmm. maybe as you would expect at certain points some some of them are certainly but yeah there's always that heft of the circumstance and rebecca ferguson to me Queen. is a very underrated actress uh still there's a line i remember in the first movie where they say someone says to her i think it's oscar is like you know you're i know you've been working things through the shadows but you don't see that in the first movie oh my goodness and then here you really get to s they pull the curtain back on that and you get to see what they mean by the power of the Bene Gesserit who work in the shadows because you're cutting between three camps here the Fremen Paul dealing with like Paul's the center of it all the Fremen the Harkonnens and then you got the Bene Gesserit. Rebecca Ferguson's role here commands the screen she may be my favorite performer across both these movies just because again the She's way excellent. she embodies the character the struggle of the character the weird mantle she has to occupy in being a conduit for these various prophecies yeah. and what Whatnot. And that's the thing about the, the shifting tone of the political nature of the movie is you see that like the politics are almost like short term circumstances and then the mysticism, the stuff that Benny Gesserit, the stuff that she is directly involved with is like the guiding hand of all those politics across generations in a, in a really yeah. wild way. And she's able to carry all of that in a way that feels quite believable, but also very emotionally resonant. All right, John, we got two minutes. We got to get out of here. So we got to speed through uh, we, the criticisms we that we probably have about this all movie. Right. Or like right. mild criticism about it. Uh, Dave Bautista to me was one of the little disappointing parts of the film to me. I feel like they really set him up in the first movie, and here he just kind of felt like yelling angry Drax. And you I want more, yeah. Yeah, and, and we've seen Dave Bautista do a variety of roles at this point. For that story he's been telling about, Denis Villeneuve is one of the first people who came to me on yeah. set and was like, you are such a you know expressive performer. Lean into that. You know, To not really have that utilized here is a bit of a bummer. I know the character of Austin Butler's comes in in the book, but if I didn't know there was a book, I would feel like, oh, they just like, they should have given this screen guy? time to Dave Bautista. Because <laughs> it sure. does feel like they trim him down for that to give him because I think this movie even though it is a long movie it doesn't feel its length at the same time there's this other version where I feel like it, it probably could have used like an extra 10 more minutes to like flesh out a few more choices the movie makes sure yeah especially there's like a plot twist that comes in pretty, I mean not plot twist for book readers but like there's a big reveal of sorts that I didn't see coming and when it happened I was like oh shit for the <laughs> journey here for the time we were here in the film maybe I'll get more from it on the second viewing I didn't quite understand the 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 point to incorporate it in this movie like at the time it happens I'm like oh shit yeah. but in the by the time it sounds like I didn't really understand why that's here in this film. Yeah, there's certain things that, that carry context that's worthwhile, but that might not exactly hit narratively the same way you would expect. My other last thing that I probably had a, a little bit of a, a gripe with was that in the first movie, I felt like the Harkonnens were imposing and scary, like truly villainous. You felt their presence for, throughout. And this movie has a bit of a different structure in terms of how they spend their time cutting between stories, and maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe because Paul's also this like snowball effect of always upgrading <laughs> throughout this entire yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really feel like they were as scary. While there's a lot of tension in this film, while there's a lot of suspense, a lot of gripping things that have a different kind of horror, that was a missing quality for me. It's easy to forget a little bit about just how 
treacherous and evil they are meant to be or, or portrayed as being when you have mostly just their foot soldiers to deal with throughout a lot of the early parts and mid parts of the movie until kind of later on. One thing I would say is like I'm very excited to see how this unfolds for me on a second viewing. It is a middle chapter to something so you do have that sort of interesting effect of like okay this is kind of finishing the one book but it's clear that this is going to continue. This is at least going to be the two towers or the Empire Strikes Back or whatever. Or the best DC movie since The Dark Knight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so like I could see like the first movie it just has all this discovery and has all this stuff you're being introduced to whereas here you are spending a lot a lot a lot of time on Arrakis. You're going even deeper into some of the more sort of theoretical aspects of the story and so I could just imagine maybe not having the same level of like sheen in terms of like oh my god this impossible everyone hypes up how impossible this book is and now that we know it's not impossible yeah. there's just a different impact upon you know going in again so not to say that even if you have high expectations they won't be met but you know it, it is there's like a layer that doesn't apply anymore because we know that this is you know something that we're capable of doing and doing well I, I feel like this is definitely a film much like the first one that will unfold on repeat viewing and give you more the more you give to it oh a thousand percent at times I think the PG-13 rating does work against all his throat slicing minor <laughs> criticism and then for a movie uh, that feels like it's rated R yeah, yeah. and uh, Christopher Walken is good but I always felt like I was watching Christopher Walken those are like minor things yeah. everyone's good and this is still like it's not just a repeat of visuals from the last experience this is totally no this, they build this, on this it this is one of those movies that you have to go to theaters to watch it yeah there are can't. some visual flares that are beautiful that aren't what you're expecting to they find a way to give this film its own visual tone and language with some more subjective other kinds of imagery that are really breathtaking and if you can see it on IMAX it, again this is please the do yourself a favor version. <laughs> do yourself yeah. a favor go get lost in this world anyway reject nation are you excited for the dune part three i know i am um because it, it has to come it just has to at this point leave your thoughts down below uh thank you to imax again for having us and we'll talk with you all soon mm -hmm.